Welcome to the first episode of Grasshopper B-Sides. The purpose of the series is to take a deep dive into the lesser known titles in the anthology of Grasshopper Manufacturers video games. Helmed by Papa Suda51, their little game company is known for churning out cult classics like Killer7 and No More Heroes. To date, I've been fascinated by every little title produced by this company. They're one of those companies that you have to cast aside any preconceptions before going into any one of their games. You just never know what to expect and that's what makes them special in my mind. They truly produce games beyond comparison and I consider myself a lifelong fan. And I hope that in making Grasshopper B-Sides, not only will I be able to introduce lovers of Grasshopper's more well-known titles to some great experiences, but also encourage Grasshopper to localize or republish these titles in the future for all to experience. Now enough with the intro, in the name of Harmon, let's talk about the Japanese exclusive Blood Plus One Night Kiss. Now, the aforementioned Killer7 was the critically divisive but cult darling hit that brought Grasshopper Manufacturer to prominence. Killer7 was known for its high contrast art style, vulgar fucking dialogue, and abstract psychological undertones in the narrative. Deservedly so, it's mine and Suda's favorite title that he's produced and one he's been actively trying to bring back, either in an HD remaster or potential sequel, but I digress. You see, cult successes don't always come with the sales to accompany it. They don't go hand in hand. Cult games typically are experimental in nature. They push many implied boundaries in either story or gameplay conventions. It doesn't always set well with gamers that don't have the patience or the palate for the avant-garde. But those whom the InVision does resonate with, well, those games make lifelong fans. Grasshopper's games are for a special breed of gamer that crave something outside the norm. And what can I say about Killer7 or any of Suda's work other than they push and challenge just about any convention about video games that I can think of. And that sort of thing was unheard of back in 2005 when Killer7 was released. Now, I'm about to speculate a little bit on my own to set the scene for the creation of Blood Plus, but I do base my reasoning off of a couple of reliable sources. And I'm doing this to better lay the framework to why Blood Plus exists at all and why it might not have released in the West. There's not a lot of concrete data or information out there about the sales of Killer7, but according to VG Charts, Killer7 sold around 150,000 units across the PS2 and GameCube versions, with about 97% of the sales coming from the Western countries, which leaves Japan at 3% of the overall sales, which should tell you about the Japanese reception to most of Suda's games. For a low-budget title from a relatively unknown known developer, Killer7 was a modest success, at least in Western countries. But it wasn't successful enough to get Capcom to publish future titles from Grasshopper Manufacturer. That much is certain. What I assume happened next was that Grasshopper needed some money to fund Suda's next big vision. So what better way than to produce not one, but two licensed games based on two successful anime series? It's certainly a great approach to go with if you want more Japanese gamers to be interested in your products. Anyways, Grasshopper Manufacturer somehow worked out a deal with Bandai to produce not one, but two games based on an anime. Blood Plus was an anime series set to air just before the game development began. Now, according to the art of Grasshopper Manufacturer, Suda mentions that Grasshopper was given a deadline for the game's production. They had to finish the game and release it during the broadcast period of the anime, so during season one. The developers were designing the game in tandem with watching the anime series as audience members. So how do you create a game that fits into the current anime series and get it out to meet a deadline without creating any plot contradictions? The 
The answer to that is to develop the game in five months and just hope to God everything works out in the end. So Blood Plus One Night Kissed is based on the anime series, which in itself was based on one of my favorite anime movies, Blood the Last Vampire. But it's only connected by slight allusions to the movie. Personally, I'd recommend the movie over the series, but the series does have its charms at times. The story is about a young schoolgirl, Saya, who has amnesia. One day, she runs into this mysterious man named Haji, who helps her fight the skinwalking vampires called Cryptarians. Chirp, chirpo Terrans. Chirp -ter vampires. And let me tell you, the show is no stranger to excessive bloodshed and gratuitous violence, so it seemed like hiring Grasshopper was a match made in heaven. Now, upon starting the game, you're gonna immediately notice it looks exactly like Killer. Killer 7. It's presented in the same high contrast art style as Killer 7, and the cell shaded look makes it timeless. I do want to see it in HD though. Now another departure from Killer7 is that this game is rendered completely in engine instead of presenting the occasional anime cutscene to explain a bit of the story, and I think that's due to having a lower budget and not being able to access the animators from the original anime because they were still working on it at the time. I can't understand the cutscenes in the first place so it doesn't matter to me. The apparent language barrier rears its head from the opening room of the game to the very last screen. And this is where many of the Westerners would stop and give up because it seems a little overwhelming. And trust me, it is a little overwhelming. Here you're introduced to Saya and her friends and the tutorial segment of the game where you wander around the classroom talking to her two friends and picking up these little glowing green balls which run down all the controls for you and tell you how to text message. And Instead of shutting this game off right then and there, in an act of pure desperation, I decided to whip out my phone and give the Google Translate app another try. I had previously used it during my Rose in the Old Castle of Twilight review with mixed success. Now I rigged this janky phone harness on my tripod so I could have the camera on my phone directly pointed at the TV in the dialogue box section during play. Now Google Translate has been recently updated to have a live trans translation feature, which often produces mixed and often hilarious results. Using augmented reality, the app superimposes English text graphics over the Japanese kanji. It produces this odd newspaper clipping serial killer ransom note text that oddly fits very well in a Suda51 game, so fuck it, it's great. Now I'm able to piece together the gist of what's going on with each of the conversations, enough to carry me through a lot of the game, but it's still not one to one, especially when characters use slang or use special characters in their text box like hearts. Still, I was able to read all of the text messages in the objective screen, which in conjunction with the world map allowed me to to make it to the fifth boss in the game, so I consider that a modest success. As you might have surmised, Blood Plus is an open world action game, which is a huge departure from Killer7's on rail style, which was really restrictive and basic, and it's an ambitious choice for a random licensed anime game. They really put their heart and soul in this, and it shows. Saya will roam the halls of the school trying to gather clues by talking to all the NPCs within the school, which will eventually lead to the next fight in the game. She runs into this gang of girls that are making fun of her appearance and prompt her to go up to the rooftop. Here's where the tutorial battle takes place. This introduces you to the combat system, which in my opinion feels like a beta of Killer is Dead. Saya swings her sword at enemies until she builds up enough blood to enter a rage mode where she can then attack the enemy really, really quickly. I know what you're thinking, it's your basic hack and slash with your dodges and your parries and your over the top style and in many ways it works. She also has this ability where she can summon Haji to lay the smack down on the enemies, it's kind of cool. Eventually, you wear down the enemies enough to pull out the finisher move. This is where Saya pricks her finger to let out some blood into her sword, which happens to be the vampire's weakness. What bugs me is that instead of trying out something new, Grasshopper opted to make these 
segments, quick time events. I'm not a fan of these, not in the slightest, but at least here you get to try again if you fail. It's not a complete game over situation, so I do give it credit for that. Regardless of how basic the battle scenes are, I do love the creature design and their transformation scenes are just outstanding. They're even more so in the anime. They kind of cut some corners here and there and it shows, but sparks are flying and shiny things are happening, so I was distracted enough to enjoy it. Now, even though this game hypes you up with the promise of badass vampire slaying, you'll be spending a majority of your time talking to NPCs, reading text messages that clue you into your next objective, and looking for Tamagotchis until you trigger enough flags needed to reach the end stage boss. Now, I didn't mind wandering around because I was distracted by all the visuals and bizarre room transitions wherein no matter what the situation, the camera pans to or from the moon. I didn't know if that was a callback to Grasshopper's other games or that had something to do with the full moon and vampires, Chiptarians. It was cool. Did I mention the outstanding beats that were produced by Masafumi Takata of Killer7 and Danganronpa fame? Did I? Because this might be his most underrated composition, at least outside of Japan. Give this soundtrack a listen. I forgot to mention, Saya isn't the only playable character in the game, as ever so often the game will transition to an original character, the Pompadour private detective Ko Ayama. Ko's segments aren't as sophisticated as Saya's, as he usually just shoots shit with his shotgun and runs about town gathering information so he can shoot more shit with his shotgun. I love his character design, it's uh, ridiculous, and I bet his personality is equally ridiculous, but I'm just a assuming. I don't actually know. I can't read Japanese. He seems to be the comedic relief in the game. Anyways, no matter what character you play as, you can always refer to the world map to find your main objective and the side quests. I'd like to mention that side quests will net you additional costumes for your characters that you can swap out in dressing rooms. I just love little touches like this because it makes me want to explore all the additional stuff. Now I didn't want to turn this game review into an anime review, but I did start watching the Blood Plus series for some context for the game. First off, the Blood Plus dub isn't all that good. Opt for the subtitles if you can. The story of the game does take place during episode 7, wherein Saya isn't featured at all in that episode. It's the only episode that doesn't feature her, so Suda wrote the game as a scenario to explain what happened to Saya during that day. It was meant to be a self-contained story, which in the original ending to the game, Suda intended to kill off Saya, or at least a clone of Saya. That's what he wrote. Now the creators of Blood Plus hated this idea and protested this decision. You cannot kill off Saya. Suda tried to argue back that it wasn't Saya, it was just a clone. But it did not matter to the creators of the anime. They were not having that shit, and they forced Suda to rewrite the story at the last minute. Despite a few hitches here and there, Blood Plus had a development cycle of only five months, and it was completed just in the nick of time. Now, I assume many assets from Killer7 were recycled to help development along, but I still admire how well Grasshopper was able to work under some such a tight deadline with the original creators breathing down their necks. In many ways, Blood Plus laid the groundwork for what would become the world of Santa Destroy in 2008's No More Heroes. Now even though many critics hated how dead the world was in No More Heroes, it does make me hopeful that one day, Grasshopper will secure a big enough budget to make a fully realized open world game in their own unique, bizarre, special style. Wishful thinking, I know. Overall, I'd say Blood Plus One Night Kiss is not the easiest game for me to recommend recommend, especially if Japanese is not your first language. Now, if it were just an action game without the mystery elements, it would be more manageable. But as you know, Grasshopper is known for their unapologetic narratives, so the end game would suffer greatly without the bizarre writing. 
throughout my experience with this game. I felt like a fish out of water, but I still found the title to be charming, even though I didn't understand what the hell was going on most of the time. I hold out hope that some translation team out there will pick this game up and make this relatively unknown title more accessible to fans outside of the East. Just download the soundtrack and give Blood the Last Vampire or Blood Plus a watch if you get the chance. They're all great. That's all I have for you in this episode. But if this is something you could crunch on, if you could dig this, then go ahead and leave a comment down below telling me if you liked it or not. Maybe mention your favorite Grasshopper game and it could appear on a future episode. Maybe not. In the name of Harmon, I'll see you all next time.